Okay, hi everyone. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today, or in this lecture, this video, is the Shockley-Kaiser limit, or why a 20% solar efficient solar panel is a marvel of engineering. And the Shockley-Kaiser limit is a theoretical limit that uh, states that any uh, silicon, any any um, solar panel that's based on the photoelectric effect, photovoltaic panel, has a upper limit of 34% efficiency in converting incoming light energy to electrical energy. And for silicon in particular, silicon-based solar panels, this is about 32%. And this is, just comes out of the basic physics of how this works. And so commercial panels are typically on the order of 15 to 20% efficient. So they're already quite near the theoretical limit. They're already quite amazing in how efficient they are. And so what I can, will show in a different lecture is how this already is more than sufficient to scale up solar to uh, any of society's requirements, any household requirements. And so these panels are already great and there's no reason to um, hold out for more efficient panels. Um, and now we're gonna try to understand the underlying physics of this today. So Shockley-Kaiser limit again. So as I said, it's any photovoltaic panel is limited to about 34%. And for silicon PV, which is 99% of panels, this is limited about 32%. And this comes out of a paper a work from 1961 by the eponymous authors who looked at who just used the basic physics um, of the system. And that's what we're gonna go over today. And since then there, you know, there are some updates, but the basic ideas hold. And so if we want to understand this, we need to understand how photovoltaics work in general, how they work fundamentally. And they're based on the photoelectric effect and NP semiconductors. And Einstein got his 1921 Nobel Prize for, quote, his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. So that's why he got the Nobel Prize, actually. And the photoelectric effect, which is what solar panels are based on, well, it's also the kind of the basis of LED lighting, interestingly enough. So solar panels basically take incoming solar light and they convert it into electricity. Uh, LEDs take incoming electricity and they convert it into light. So these are both based on the same uh, NP semiconductors and they both use them, uh, operate, have the same physics or at work. Okay, so let's understand NP semiconductors first. We need, and, and the photoelectric effect, these are coupled. But first we need to recall some basic chemistry here, okay? So we're gonna go to our periodic table of elements and we're gonna see on this periodic table, you know, this is a big table, but there are two elements or a few elements in particular that they're interested in. We're interested in carbon, we're interested in silicon, and then we're also gonna be interested in phosphorus and boron here. Now, let's zoom a little bit. Carbon, carbon is the sixth element. It is the basis of all life, carbon-based life. And so for carbon-based life, well, you're here, you're element six. And what, this, what you have is you have something called, you have basically these orbitals, these orbitals of electrons, electrons around, the nucleus of the atom. And carbon happens to have four of these. And to get a, quote, full valence, you have to come over here, seven, eight, nine, 10, here to get 10 electrons. So this is telling you how many electrons there are. And so if you want a full valence of electrons, you need to add four electrons to get carbon all the way over here. And basically elements want a full valence. And so because you can share valence electrons with other nucleus, other atoms, you can create carbon lattices, you can create hydrocarbon chains. You can do this in very complicated ways. This is why you can have life because you can create all these very complicated organic molecules that are based on carbon. Silicon, which is down a layer in the, in the table, silicon here, well, it also has uh, basically wants to get a full valence. And so silicon can also form complicated lattice structures. And so that where, that's kind of where the sci-fi trope of silicon-based life comes from, is these two elements have similar chemistry. Carbon you can do a lot more with, but silicon you can also do similar things because of this chemistry. So silicon atoms, as I just said, they have these four valence electrons, just like carbon. They want, four, they want a full valence. And so, as I said, you can share electrons with other atoms through what are called covalent bonds. Um, and basically you come up with a crystal lattice. So you have all these, all these nuclei for the silicon and they're sharing their atoms in these, you know, in these covalent bonds. And so now they all have eight, all the eight valence electrons and everyone's happy. It's a happy lattice of silicon. So the photoelectric effect, well, what is this? What this means is that light comes in light comes in and it basically 
disrupts these bonds. And so you have, you leave this light strikes the electron and it, and it frees it essentially. So you have a free electron, which is negatively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. Remember nuclei are positively charged. And now you have a hole, which is relative, which is positively charged where that electron was and your free electron. That's all the photoelectric effect is you know, at the basis. So if you shine light on a crystal, excuse me, a silicon crystal lattice, well, you're going to get a bunch of free electrons that are negatively charged and leaving a bunch of holes that are positively charged. And these holes and electrons can freely migrate throughout this lattice, but they're just kind of doing this randomly and you're not generating any useful current. Remember, current is the movement of charge. It allows you to do, if you can control this, you can do useful work. You can generate you know, electricity. Um, if you just have silicon crystal, you, you know, nothing, nothing useful happens. So how do you get a useful current? How do you get a solar panel that's workable, that's usable? Well, you have to introduce impurities into the silicon matrix to create this permanent charge separation. This is the NP semiconductor idea. And so on the N side here, you're going to have a permanent positive charge. And on the P side, you're going to have a permanent negative charge. And with that charge separation, well, then those negatively charged electrons can now flow between, you know, flow directionally, and then they can flow across this eternal external load, and then you can actually harvest useful work from this. So how do we create this charge separation? Well, we create these impurities or we're called dopants. And again, this comes out of our, our periodic table. So again, we have carbon here. It has four valence electrons. Well, to the left, there's boron. It only has three valence electrons. And so this is a P-type dopant. Boron has these three valence electrons, so if you put it in the lattice, it just doesn't have an electron here to share with its neighbor. So you're going to have holes. You have these holes, and this is electrically neutral at this stage, but you're going to have these holes. Now, on the other side, you have, well, you know, here was carbon, here was boron. Well, same thing. Silicon has four valence electrons. You go to the right, now you have five and now you have an extra unpaired electron. So you have this extra unpaired electron and it can be easily freed. So this can leave a positive nucleus and a negatively charged free electron. So you can create holes in free electrons that are you know, essentially permanent um, by adding these dopants into the silicon. So again, so what we do, so this, the N-type silicon is where we have our phosphorus. So our phosphorus, we have a free electron we have you know, an extra electron, so this one frees, and he, he wanders off. He wanders off, leaving a positive charge. Well, there's a hole here. There's a hole that he can find over here on the P-type silicon. So now he joins up, fills the hole, and now you have a negative charge over here. So now you've created this permanent charge separation, this permanent electrical voltage difference, if you like. So now we've done this introduce these impurities with dopants, we have this charge separation. Now, when we have incident light generating these electron hole pairs, now there's a charge separation, there's a, a voltage drop across which they can go. So we get these electrons, negatively charged hole pairs, and now because of this charge separation, the electrons flow this way. They flow here, and if we attach with some wires an external load here. Well, the electrons flow this way. Now they can flow across and come back. And so now we get this useful current. So great. Now we can do current. This is an elect this is a silicon solar cell. This is all it is. So how efficient is this process? I said light comes in, it creates this useful current now. Well, how what percentage of that light en energy can actually be converted into a useful current? Well, there are three fundamental mechanisms that limit how much energy we can harvest. And the most important and the one, only one I'm really gonna talk about is this idea of spectrum losses. So what's this idea here? Well, first we need to understand that when, you, when, you, when the incoming photon hits the electron, frees it, moves it in what's called the conduction band, this, only take, this takes a very specific amount of energy, no more, no less. And so we can use electron volts as our unit of energy, and we need exactly 1.1 electron volts to excite this electron if we're using silicon. This varies for different materials. And this energy requirement is called the band gap energy. In other words, it's the energy we need to move it into the conduction band. 
And so that incident photon comes in. If the photon is less energetic, if it doesn't have 1.1 electron volts, there's no excitation. So nothing happens, you lose 100% of that energy. It's exactly 1.1 electron volts of energy. Well, we get a free electron and no wasted energy. If it's above 1.1 electron volts, well, we again, we get this excitation, so great, but any extra energy is also lost. You know, we didn't get any extra bang for our buck. So now, knowing this, well, now we need to know what the spectrum, or, or relate this to the spectrum of the sun, because the sun has a spectrum and different photons have different amounts of energies coming in. They don't have all the same amount. And so remember, photon energy from physics is proportional, that's what this symbol means if you don't know, one over the wavelength. In other words, it's proportional to the frequency and the frequency is one over the wavelength. So the shorter the wavelength, the more energy you have. And we can look at this graphically, so don't worry about that not too much. Just think of it graphically here. So what we have here is the solar spectrum. So this is maybe a little bit busy, but this black line here, this, this second black line, is the spectrum of the energy that's actually hitting the Earth's surface. And so, and this is the wavelength here on the x-axis. And so here's the visible band. This is where most of the sun's energy is. And that's not surprising, right? We see in the visible band, it makes sense that we see where most of the energy is. And so there's some energy here in the ultraviolet and there's some here in the infrared and so on. That's not energetic enough for us to perceive as visible light. Um, but this is the spectrum. And remember, the longer the wavelength, the less energy. The shorter the wavelength, the more energy. And at some point, we're going to hit that magic number of 1.1 electron volts. And we can see where that is. We can see where that is and we, from, from just our basic equations. So again, we don't need to worry too much about the, about the math, but we know that the energy in a photon, this is the Planck-Einstein relation, is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And so what we can say here is that as you go along, you know, this is not necessarily to scale. This is just a, this, excuse me, this, this inscribed uh, uh, spectrum is not to scale. It's just to help you visualize this. So what we can see is that for a short wavelength, more photon energy. That's what this blue line is. So blue line is photon energy, short wavelength, more energy. Wavelength gets longer, less and less energy. So here at this wavelength, around 11, 1200 nanometers is where our 1.1 electron volts is. This is our magic cutoff. So any photon on this side, is not gonna have enough energy to excite the electrons in the silicon lattice. Energy, any, any photon on this side is going to have enough energy, but any excess will be lost. So showing you this again, just kind of in words. Okay, here, no energy. Here, well, this was perfect. 100% of the energy got converted into exciting the electron. Um, this is our gap. This is our excess energy that was wasted. So here, you know, you can see that almost, almost two thirds of our energy was lost. Um, we are still getting the effect. We're just not using it. As, you're not using that energy as, as efficiently as we could if our photon had a different amount of energy. So again, so now we can visualize all these losses using a plot. So again, so not to not to harp on it too much, but let's just again use the band gap of 1.1 electron volts. Here's our cutoff. 100% of energy is recovered, and so here our photon energy is below the band gap. So don't get confused. You know, high wavelength lower energy. So here the photon energy is too low. So we lose about 14% of the incoming solar energy that way. Here, again, we're recovering this energy and this is what we think of as our spectral efficiency. And so we're recovering about 50% of the overall energy that's coming in uh, is useful energy to excite these electrons. And then this yellow part here, which again, gets a bigger and bigger component as we go to the shorter and shorter wavelengths, this is just the energy that's lost, excess energy that's lost. And so if you change your band gap, you're going to change these distributions. So let's say our band gap was really small. Let's say it was really easy to excite these electrons. Well, that's great in some sense because now most of our photons can excite the electrons, but it's bad because we're, you know, that gap gets bigger over here on the left side. So we only lose a teeny tiny bit of energy to, you know, being below the band gap, but we have a lot of energy losses because of this excess. So this isn't actually as good. We, we only recover about 30% of the energy as useful current, you know, useful uh, yeah, uh, potential current anyway. Um, whereas here we recovered about 50%. You know, going down to one electron volt again, you know, basically the same as 1.1, unsurprisingly, 49, 50% of the energy is recovered. 
uh, if we make our band gap higher, again, we're now we're not use, losing as much energy here as excess, but we're losing too much energy here below the band gap. So here we're only recovering about 45% of the energy. And obviously, as we keep increasing our band, band gap, we're, we're getting less and less energy. So there's an optimum, there's an optimum point here. Um, that balances these two energy losses to recover the most useful work, most useful energy. And so we can just visualize this. This is just calculated using the spectrum and using these, just this, uh, these spectral losses. And so our theoretical um, maximum efficiency for a solar cell here for any material, you know, just depending on what its solar cell band gap is, looks like this. And so the max is just about 50% and that's just about right here, you know, and that's just about exactly where silicon is. So it turns out it's a good material for solar cells. And now there's two other main forms of losses. These are called radiative recombination. Um, this is the bigger one. And so this is just the idea that, well, you're, you're shining the light on, you're creating these electron hole pairs. Well, sometimes they're just gonna randomly recombine. You know, not every single one is going to flow across this charge gradient and give you useful work. Some are going to just recombine randomly and you lost the energy because they just, you know, that was no longer useful. And then there's just intrinsic, you know, resistance in the circuit. And so you're gonna lose energy from that too. And so these are your two other things that give you energy losses. And so your overall theoretical maximum efficiency for a solar cell based on NP, semiconductors and the photoelectric effect is about 34% and for silicon in particular based on its band gap of 1.1 electron volts it's about 32%. So that's the, the essence of why solar cells can not give you higher than 32% at least for a single junction and the you know, semiconductor cell. And so 15 to 20% is really amazing. Getting you know, anywhere close to two thirds or even closer of the theoretical max is great. And new monocrystalline panels are routinely you know, around 20% or so. And there are even 25% panels that exist. So this is quite amazing. Um, and there's no reason to, to say you shouldn't wait to use solar to make them a little more efficient or anything like that. And so just our final summary, solar cells are based on NP semiconductors and the photoelectric effect. Sunlight creates these electron hole pairs in the silicon matrix because we have dopants that have a charge separate that create a permanent charge separation in our in our wafer. We can have the free electrons generated by the photoelectric effect flow across a load and give us useful current. That's the idea. Our band gap is the photon energy required to create this electron hole pair. Less energy, we get no effect. Any excess energy is wasted. And so based on the sun's light spectrum, 1.1 electron volts for silicon, which is, you know, the value for silicon is essentially the optimum. And finally, the, this, you know, any excess energy wasted or any energy not, you know, that's too low, these are the spectral losses and that in combination, you know, in combination with radiative combination and circuit resistant combined to limit solar silicon uh, photovoltaics to about 32% efficiency and existing tech is amazing. So that's it. Um, next, next lecture, give a brief overview of how these panels are actually manufactured. And that will be next time. Trying to stop recording. I'll edit this off. <laughs>